Hello everyone, welcome to ML News. Today, I just want to look into one story, which is a hearing in front of the US Senate. It essentially gives the Senate an opportunity to interview some people from the field and to make more informed decisions. Invited to the hearing, as far as I can tell, were Christina Montgomery of IBM, Gary Marcus, professor at NYU, and Sam Altman of OpenAI. I want to just comment on a few things that I think are worth commenting on. I'm working off of the summary of a machine learning street talk. I think Tim does an excellent job doing a broader summary of what happened and giving some of his comments. So definitely recommend you go and watch the MLST video on this one. It goes into a lot more topics than I will go into here. Second, clearly defining risks. There must be clear guidance on AI uses or also, I will not be commenting much on Christina Montgomery's testimony right here, because coming from IBM, it's just corporate speech, as, as far as I can tell. As this technology advances, we understand that people are anxious about how it could change the way we live. We are too. So I think in broad here, Sam Altman makes a, you know, really nice presentation and his takes are really smart. Like you clearly notice he's a very intelligent person and he's quite optimistic. Like he manages to convey that optimism about the future of AI and the future of this technology and all. And I find his takes, for example, how it's going to affect the job market and how it's going to affect the economy and all of that. I find them to be very reasonable and, and very well argued and very well said here. So I want to give compliments to that. I feel it makes a really good case for the field of AI to be part of the future and not to make people that afraid or anything like this and to make people genuinely excited about it. So I have no troubles with that. Compliments to Sam for all of this. I do want to comment on the things obviously where I disagree, but don't take that as an indication that I disagree with Sam on all things. Again, I recommend to watch the MLST video on this to get more of his testimony. The biggest disagreement, and I think that's for a lot of people, goes when Sam goes into the topic of potentially licensing AI companies. Here is how that sounds like. I think that regulatory intervention by governments will be critical to mitigate the risks of increasingly powerful models. For example, the US government might consider a combination of licensing and testing requirements for development and release of AI models above a threshold of capabilities. So notably, he says the licensing and testing requirements should be for models above certain capabilities. And he elaborates later on that as well. New approach, any new law does not stop the innovation from happening with smaller companies, open source models, researchers that are doing work at a smaller scale. That's a wonderful part of this ecosystem and of America. We don't want to slow that down. There still may need to be some rules there. Um, but I think we could draw a line at systems that need to be licensed in a very intense way. The easiest way to do it, I'm not sure if it's the best, but the easiest would be to talk about the amount of compute that goes into such a model. So we could, you know, we could define a threshold of compute and it'll have to go, it'll have to change. It could go up or down, uh, it could down as we discover more efficient algorithms that says above this amount of compute, you are in this regime. Um, what I would prefer, uh, it's harder to do, but I think more accurate, is to define some capability thresholds and say a model that can do things X, Y, and Z, up to you all to decide, uh, that's now in this licensing regime, but models that are less capable, you know, we don't want to stop our open source community. We don't want to stop individual researchers. We don't want to stop new startups can proceed, you know, with a different frame. As you can, please state which capabilities you'd propose we consider for the purposes of this definition. Uh, I would love rather than to do that off the cuff to follow up with your office with like a well, perhaps opine things. O opine understanding that you're just responding uh, and you're not making law. All right. In the spirit of just opining, um, I think a model that can uh, persuade, manipulate, influence a person's behavior or a person's beliefs, that would be a good threshold. Um, I think a model that could help create novel biological agents would be a great threshold. Things like that. So I think one thing is clear from this clip, this person knows what he's talking about, which is not the case with all of the witnesses here in front of the Senate. This clearly comes from experience and from a technical expertise in the matter, even though Sam Altman might not be on the forefront of actually training these things, there is a clear handle on what actually makes the capabilities and so on. I find the reasoning of this I find to be sound. I don't think the I, I disagree, but I find 
find the reasoning of it to be sound in terms of, okay, if we regulate something, probably compute is sort of the best proxy for sort of capabilities, and it would be better to measure capabilities, but we can't yet. I mean, that all is reasonable. What I have trouble with is in the first place suggesting this regulation, because essentially saying, you know, there should be a line where you need to be licensed and anything below is fine, because we don't want to crush the open source ecosystem and so on, you know, but then there is a line essentially that says, you know, if you just do your itty bitty thing in your garden, right, and it's small, and it's cute, right, you know, no problem for us. But it's a long standing element in the playbook of big corporations to ask and to welcome regulatory actions, because imposing regulations, imposing licenses automatically means it makes it much harder for anyone else to enter that market. So the position is as long as you're doing your things down here, that's fine. But if you really if you want to come up to our level, right, if the open source community for some reason actually gets a handle on these things and threatens open AI's virtual monopoly now or, or duopoly now with Google entering the market, then we should, you know, clamp down regulatorily and conforming with regulations is easy. If Microsoft ships billions and billions of dollars into you, like you can handle it, but you very much know that the open source community, for example, cannot handle it. They cannot handle a lawsuit. They cannot handle or easily handle regulatory compliance. We've seen time and time again that the open source community actually manages to reach and surpass the level of commercial offerings. Think of the Linux operating system, which is now powering almost the entire internet, as does the Apache web server and things like this. Open source technology will catch up. And that is exactly the effect that licensing and testing requirements and all of this have is to squash that competition and to make it much, much harder for small businesses and for startups to reach open AI's level and threaten their business. And the fact that Ooh, there is a line and the licensing should only apply above this line. It is a bit better in that it actually lets the open source community do some things at their level, but it has the same effects, right? Because ultimately, we engage in open source, we engage in research, we engage in competition to displace the market leader, because there is going to be an improved offering, there's going to be a more transparent offering in the future. And in all cases, that regulation denies that or makes it much harder. And I find it to be quite disturbing that Sam Altman here asks for this while couching it in sort of the language of Oh, it's all safety related. But ooh, the open source community is so important. Like no, you profit highly, highly from the fact that open source software in the past not only has reached the capabilities of commercial offerings, but vastly surpassed them without any regulatory oversight. Is there an FDA for Linux? No, there isn't, right? The source code is open, you can see what's in there. And that is much more of a safety guarantee and a guarantee of you understand what's going on than any other thing. And yes, I get it with neural networks. It's not like source code where I can read it and flat out sort of make a test for it. But with large enough software systems, that's the case too, like Linux. And I think if we were to publish what data went into these big models, how exactly they were trained, if we were to publish their weights, then we would have insane amounts of knowledge of you know, what's possible, what's not possible, and how to deploy them safely. But that's that's exactly what OpenAI doesn't want to do. They're more and more secretive about exactly what's in their model. And that's the other part. There are some people still agreeing with Sam Altman here and saying, well, what if they really believe these things are dangerous? You know, doesn't this make sense, right, to have the agencies and so on? And I'll show you a second clip here. Labor. Should we consider independent testing labs to provide scorecards and nutrition labels or the equivalent of nutrition labels? packaging that indicates to people whether or not the content can be trusted, what the ingredients are. So the question is, should there be nutrition labels that tell people what's in these models? Listen to Sam's answer right here. That people, users are, are pretty sophisticated and understand where the mistakes are that they need or likely to be, that they need to be responsible um, for verifying what the models say, that they go off and check it. Um, I, I worry that as the models get better and better, uh, the users can have sort of less and less of their own discriminating thought process around it. But, but I think users are more capable than we could often give them credit for in, in conversations like this. 
I think a lot of disclosures, which if you've used ChatGPT, you'll see about the inaccuracies of the model um, are also important. And I'm, I'm excited for a world where companies publish with the models information about how they behave, where the inaccuracies are, and independent agencies or companies provide that as well. I think it's a great idea. Sam directs the conversation into, again, the realm of capabilities and where the inaccuracies are and what the models are capable of. But a really easy thing to say, which Gary Marcus repeats sometimes in this hearing, is how about you just publish the data that went into it? How about you just publish how you trained it, how long it was trained, and so on. OpenAI notoriously, notoriously, and with glee, as far as I can tell, denied to give the research community any of that data in their latest technical report purposefully hiding it like it was very common until that point to say here's our model this is the size here is what it was trained on here is how it was trained here is the loss here is how it behaves and so on on different things and open ai has anything but that last category where they demonstrated they can take a bar test and pass it anything other than that they have deliberately obscured so they have deliberately went completely against that idea of a nutrition label hey let's tell people what's inside so they can make an informed decision and so that they can deploy these things safely. So if Sam Altman was really, first of all, as he says, you know, give the users more credit because they should be able to make their own decisions using this technology. And if he actually thought it was a good idea to do these nutrition labels, he'd be very much for, you know, publishing all of the ingredients right here. And an effective regulation could be that once you deploy, I don't know, a model, you have to disclose in some way what's inside. I'm not per se for that, but rather than whatever is proposed right here, just saying you have to disclose the dates or you have to publish the weights. I don't know. We have to make it economically viable. But Sam clearly directs the conversation away from that and back into the regime of who capabilities. And yeah, so combined with the sayings before, we need some kind of licensing and testing above a certain threshold. And we will deliberately not tell you what's inside there is I don't think that combo makes a lot of sense. I don't think that's a coherent line, except under the aspect of hey, let's make sure we have some business tomorrow. And let's make sure we make it as hard as possible for others to uh, threaten that business. Lastly, I want to make a comment on the statements made by Gary Marcus here. I legitimately don't know why Gary Marcus is in this hearing, but he is so good for him, I guess. Um, but here is how that goes from the inherent unreliability of current systems. A law professor, for example, was accused by a chatbot of uh, sexual harassment, untrue. And it pointed to a Washington Post article that didn't even exist. The more that that happens, the more that anybody can deny anything. As one prominent lawyer told me on Friday, defendants are starting to claim that plaintiffs are making up legitimate evidence. These sorts of allegations undermine the abilities of juries to decide what or who to believe and contribute to the undermining of democracy. No way. Are you saying stuff that's written isn't always true? That is, I, I, I'm, con okay, forget everything I said. Like that convinces me because I mean, so far before we had GPT-4 and, and all of these things, everything that was written was true. Like any allegation, you know, any person claiming that something was in a news article or there was some study proving something was certainly correct in doing so. Every allegation made by defendants about evidence, like no one has ever lied in a court or made up stuff or made up evidence. This is, it's a new world, man. And we, I, I'm convinced. Like, you know, these things can make false statements that just wasn't possible before. I, I tried using this technology called email once. I wanted to, to scam someone. I wanted to persuade someone of something, but it just wouldn't let me. But th this is the statement. It can make up stuff. Like, what, what kind of a bar is this for no other technology in the world has been held to the standards of it can make up stuff, therefore it's, it's bad, or it can be used to make up stuff. A keyboard can be used to make up stuff. I can find tons of made up stuff on Google. I can generate tons of made up stuff using Photoshop. Actually, Sam Altman has a take on that as well, if you, you can find it in this testimony, where he says, and I find that to be very reasonable, where he says, look, the world has seen Photoshop, and for a while, 
while Photoshop has fooled some people, but then very quickly people realized, oh, hey, not everything that's a picture is, you know, real. And he says, well, this is the same, but on steroids. But, you know, we've had to deal for a long time with text may not be true. So I fail to see that just because it becomes a bit cheaper to hire, you know, GPT-4 rather than, I don't know, some labor farm in a low wage country. Like, yes, it's a bit cheaper to write false things at scale. I don't see how that fundamentally changes how we think about these things. And I get tons of email each day asking me for some sort of money. And I'm perfectly fine, perfectly fine. Even though, you know, according to Gary Marcus also, these systems, they are, you know, have lacks so far. They're not as good as humans yet. So the humans trying to convince me that send me these emails, they should be smarter than that, right? And so far, they haven't managed yet. Like I only ever sent money to legitimate uncles who died and I had to pay the lawyer's fees. Then there was a problem and I never got them, but it was totally fine. So that was my take on these things. Again, watch Tim's video. It's really cool. It's about 50 minutes long and you'll get the most important parts of that hearing. Bye-bye.